Hey everyone, my name is Mark Taylor, and I apologize if you can hear my French Bulldogs uh, snoring in the background, but that's just the world I live in. And today we're going to be talking about two books that are, I guess you'd consider them horror books or thrillers. I am a big fan of creature movies, creature books, creature stories. So today we have a double creature feature. No, no graphics? We don't, have, we don't have any graphics. Okay. So I love these types of books. So when I think about a creature feature, if you can take the plot and story of a sci-fi original movie, which are really out there, but usually have bad CG and bad acting, but you take that and you put that story and those creatures and you put it into a decent readable book, I'm in. You've got me. Take my money. Or don't take my money. I mean, I, you know, if I can read it for free, that'd be awesome too. But I love those types of stories. So today we're going to be looking at Kronos Rising by Max Hawthorne. And then we're going to be looking at Don't Move by James S. Murray and Darren Wearmouth. Kronos Rising is a story that has a pleosaur or a chronosaur that has survived millions of years and this beast is about 50 feet long and it is terrorizing a coastal town in Florida. The story follows two main protagonists of Jake Braddock who is a sheriff and a former Olympian fencer. Uh, he is the sheriff in this town that the chronosaur is starting to terrorize. And then you have a marine biologist named Amara Takagi. Obviously, he's a male, she's a female in the story, so they're going to become love interests. As far as the actual story goes itself, the author is at his best when he is describing this chronosaur in its environment. Uh, the science in it seems very plausible. Um, the descriptions of the actual beast, the reptile, the prehistoric reptile are fantastic. And I would think it would be hard to keep the scenes where it's swimming and it's trying to find prey and it's feeding on whales and attacking things. He keeps it very fresh and it does not feel like a chore to read these sections. And it's actually by far the most interesting part of the book. The worst part of this book were the characters. Now I give him major credit for not just putting together some cardboard characters, you're gonna get eaten, you're gonna save the day, you're annoying. He gives his characters backstory, he gives them motivations. And so I give him major credit for creating characters that are unique and fleshed out. Unfortunately, they are extremely fleshed out. This is a 500 page book. Now, for a story like this, the emphasis, unless you're doing something unique or something different, the emphasis should be on the fact that there is this prehistoric 50 foot creature uh, terrorizing people and killing things in the ocean. Like that's what type of book this is. And yet there's, there's gotta be a hundred pages of needless backstory on these characters. And some of the backstory is just brutal. Like Jake's dad was abusive and some of that was hard to read and then Amara encountered these seal killers and that was just a brutal scene. I ended up skimming a lot of character uh, parts of the story, especially when it got to the end. They're on the boat, it's kind of that jaw scene where they're on the boat, they're gonna go kill the creature. And, and I just felt like it hung the story up. I felt like the plot's going and it's moving. We're going towards the climax and you're just stalling. You're just stalling. You're just stalling. It felt like the scene in the King Kong, the Peter Jackson movie where he gets to New York City, he being the big gorilla, and then he escapes. And that's where you're supposed to have all the action and the scene going up at the Empire State Building. And then he's all of a sudden, he's in uh, the was it a uh, central park and he's he's playing on the ice with a female lead and it was just a weird it just stopped all of the action and i felt like all of the character scenes especially at the end of the book just stopped all the action the the dialogue was very cringy in some points you have this uh young police officer uh who's under jake's care and he says things like gee that's swell which 
it just didn't make any sense. And then the most frustrating part was all of this is clearly building to the the big fight, the big confrontation between your protagonist and the creature. And like I said, the creature parts are excellent. The action, well done. Uh, very good writing as far as that goes. But then they get to this big scene where they're going to be taking on this creature in a submersible. And there's this, this is going to be spoilers, spoiler alert. I'm just going to say this. They don't actually show the death of the creature. They just tell you it happened. The creature's dead. We did it. That's it. They don't describe it at the, in the book at all. And that was just a, what are you doing? That was so frustrating and just a, this book, this type of book is leading, it should have the same things and characteristics and tropes of these types of stories. And yet you get to the very end and you don't actually show the climactic death of this creature. But overall, I'd give it a five or a six out of 10. If it had cut a hundred pages out of the book, just some of the, the, the exhaustive backstory to these characters, uh, I think you could have had a much more taut story and just just kept the pace going. But it was it felt very long. Uh, a lot of the, the people parts were not that great, but the character, the creature character, the creature writing the description and that sort of plot was very interesting. And it was a very plausible way that it could have survived all of this time. I thought that was actually a very interesting part of the story about how it survived and how it came to be in modern times. So I'd give it a five or six out of 10. The second book in this creature feature is by Darren Wearmouth and James S. Murray. One of them, I don't watch the show, is part of the Impractical Jokers. And the other one is another author who writes uh, thrillers and, and kind of horror stuff. I'm imagining this book got a publicity push and just got made because of people these authors knew. It's 180 pages long and it was bad. It was really bad. I would give it maybe a two or three stars. The writing, you know, the writing, it's its readable. It's, it's not the worst book I've ever read. There are far worse books out there, but let's take a look at this. This is... This book was crazy. The story itself follows your main protagonist, Megan Forrester, and she has a tragedy, and then she goes on this camping trip with a church group, and they end up in the woods, and there is a giant, massive, eight-foot spider that starts killing everybody. That's the plot of the story. That's, that's it in a nutshell. The beginning of this book was one of the most exciting, tense, insane first chapters I've ever read. And I was legitimately hyped and, and amped up after reading this first chapter because it was crazy. It was almost a Final Destination type beginning where everything just goes crazy. She and her husband and her young son are at a fair and they get on one of those... Uh, those rides where you sit in the seats and they're on these long chains and as it spins around the seats spin out and you're just flying around and she didn't feel good so she doesn't get on it well this ride starts to break down and so the center pole starts to bend over and this thing's just whipping people around well people start hitting the ground slamming into the ground and then her husband and her son their chair flies off and they end up landing in a concession stand and then this thing catches on fire. And then her son and her husband burned to death right in front of her. It was insane. Like, I mean, I, I got done and was kind of one of those like nervous giggle laughing where you're just like, oh my gosh. Like this was brutal. It was a brutal start to all this. And then the book continues after that chapter. It's 180 pages. I don't think you even see really anything with the spider for a good 80 pages after this. So you have this brutal, crazy, insane opening chapter. And then the book picks up six months later when she's, she's obviously traumatized, as anybody would be. And so she thinks, hmm, what's the most logical thing I would do to try to get back into my life and to try to, to just get going again? Huh, 
what about if I went on a random camping trip with the church group of a church that I kind of attended and don't really know anybody at? Yeah, that's probably how I'll insert myself back into society. And so you've got this weird church camping trip that takes a trip down, I think, to the Appalachians to go camping. And this group is just, you've got an old couple and a grandson. You've got the church pastor or priest. You've got his daughter and her current boyfriend. You have the bad boy ex-boyfriend of the, the daughter. You've got... Uh, the, the crazy wild guide. It's just a weird, like one, this group is never going to happen. This is just a weird, a church camping trip is what she does. Like it, none of it makes sense. And then the dialogue's not great. It's really flimsy. Um, it, this is, it could have been a good story. It could have been a fun, interesting, like I said, I love the creature feature. This could have been awesome. But the whole point of this is the creepiness and the terror of this giant spider you don't really see anything about the spider, like I said, until about 80 pages in of a 180 page story. What should have happened was you start the book with a couple randos in the woods who encounter this spider that sets up the sense of this is what's waiting in the woods. This is the sense of dread. Oh my gosh, they're going to be ending up here. This thing is waiting for them. Where did it come from? Where did it go? Where did you go? Eight Eye Joe, but but none of this happens, so you don't see the actual villain, the creature, for way f too far in the book. And then when it comes, it just starts wiping people out, like just dropping them. There's no real sense of suspense. It finally gets into a cool place where it's got the webbing is uh, just throughout the forest and woods, so it kind of has that system where it can tell where people are if you touch the webbing. So that's kind of cool. And they have like fluorescent lights where they can see that the whole forest is just crisscrossed with the stuff. And that's kind of creepy. I had one genuinely creepy uh, moment in it that I don't want to go into because I don't want to ruin it. I don't, it's not, it's a bad book. Don't buy it. I, I got it for $2 on Kindle because they were selling it for 20 bucks brand new. 180 page book and it's bad. Um, but there's no description. You would... The, the thing in these types of books or these types of stories is that there has to be at least some sort of science based on this creature. It's a giant insect. It's a giant arachnid that is just, it's massive and it just kills things. Like, how is it there? What is the science behind it? There's got to be something. They really don't go into even any of the cool science about spiders, about how it hunts and about all of that. It's just all from a character's perspective. They don't even speculate about this thing. There's nothing about the history of this organism and, and how it got to be there and, and why it's there. And then it just, you know, it ends in a, a big fiery conclusion. And it was a bad book. Like that, that is, and it's, and it's got all kinds of good critical raving reviews and there's nothing scary about it. There's nothing interesting about it. Like I said, read the first chapter. The first chapter is amazing. And then just put it down and forget about it. But yeah, that's that's my uh, take. I'd give it a 2, maybe a 3 out of 10. But 180 pages felt a lot longer than that. And there's really nothing to the story. So I would avoid that. Chronos Rising, might check it out if you're a big fan of the Meg, uh, the Meg series by Steve Alton check it out. So that is my double creature feature of the day. Keep reading as always. My name is Mark Taylor. You are more loved and valued than you can possibly imagine.